give me one moment here for my computer to decide that we're going to go live. <laughs> screen bigger too. Oh, there we go. All right, fantastic. Oh, Steve Sidow. I haven't seen him in a while. That's Steve. Oh, hey, Steve. Yes, yeah, these good people. Okay, so we are. Oh, wait, hold on. Give me one second here. Let me go ahead. And... Um. All right, so we are live, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, and today we have our esteemed guest, Mr. Sean Billings. Sean, how are yeah. you today? Good, I'm good, thank you. And uh, if it, those of you who don't know Sean's work, Sean is a trumpeter, composer, arranger of the Los Angeles area. You've heard him play with, uh, sorry. <laughs> You've heard him play with, uh, you know, uh, Selena Gomez, U2, uh, Elton John, and uh, you might know his work with the Brian Sets Orchestra. So, and uh, Sean's a jack of all trades and, uh, you know, kind of, you know, just your all around trumpet player and um, great guy. And uh, so, Sean, thank you for joining us today. How are you today, man? Good, man. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Be fun. Uh, so, Sean, why don't you go ahead and tell us about your, uh, your, your background, man, and, you know, how you were, uh, how you got in, how you started, how you got the horn in your hand, all that good stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, basically, it's, it's kind of the standard story. I started playing in uh, fifth grade, and, uh, I'm from Chicago, California. Uh, moved around a lot as a kid, but then kind of settled in Southern California when I was 10, and uh, so that would have been, whatever, fifth grade. Started playing then and, you know, really fortunate in retrospect to have a really good band director uh, for, uh, for elementary school. Uh, Steve Benefield was his name and I think he just retired a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, I, I, it wasn't like I had these acclamations to be, or, you know, this idea of being a musician. Uh, we just, you had to be in band at my school for like two weeks and, uh, after then you could kind of decide if you wanted to stay with it. And, you know, I picked trumpet because it looked cool. Like it wasn't some big epiphany. And uh, my parents were gracious enough to get me a private teacher um, right away. So I kind of was taking lessons from day one. And uh, with this, uh, a woman named Karen Kazak, who um, is just, I mean, to this day, I still hold her in the highest regards, not only as an educator, but as a player. Um, just, you know, she ended up teaching a uh, junior high band for a long time in Southern California, but, you know, there's no reason she couldn't have been a full-time professional trumpet player. I just know she loved teaching and she was actually a stamp student. So she studied with Jimmy Stamp and, um, you know, kind of got me on that thing right away, as well as like the Arvin's book and all the, the classic stuff. It was kind of like day one, this is what, this is kind of what you're doing. Um, so, you know, played obviously elementary school, junior high. Um, at the end of junior high, I, I knew I wanted to play trumpet, but I was kind of going through this phase, you know, that I didn't know if I wanted to do like marching band and all that kind of stuff. But my best friend at the time was a trombone player and he was like, you know, don't be an idiot, like come do marching band because you get P credit and blah, blah, blah. So I kind of did that. And uh, I went to Capo Valley or Capistrano Valley high school in Mission Viejo. And um, in retrospect, there was a really great music program, um, some really amazing trumpet players that were there and uh, just a great organization. You know, one of our, uh, who's still a really dear friend of mine was a trombone player, but he was also like an amazing violin player and viola. And now he's principal of the uh, Las Vegas Philharmonic and 
he subs in the Chicago Symphony and all the big ones and stuff like that. So there was a lot of great players back then and a couple drummers that went on to be some pretty big film composers and things like that. And so it's uh, it was a really good environment. Um, again, there was definitely, in retrospect, a lot of stuff that I didn't learn in high school. Um, you know, I really didn't know much about like majoring in music at the time. The Our band director was a great dude. Just, it was kind of his first gig, <laughs> I think after he graduated college. And so there was a lot of information that we weren't really privy to. But, uh, but during that time I was doing drum and bugle corps. I started with the Velvet Knights when I was- uh, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, I think, I guess I would have been a junior and then I started doing Blue Devils my senior year. And so that was kind of like my experience instead of doing like, you know, summer camps or whatever like that, I was I was doing drum and bugle corps. And then, um, so I did drum and bugle corps for four years. So I did, or five years, excuse me, one with Velvet Knights, four years with Blue Devils. And um, so, you know, a lot of times I get the question of, you know, did you ever know when was the day you knew you want to be a musician and for me it was never like that um i just always enjoyed playing and that's kind of what i did and i always was like moving on to the next thing and so at that time i was studying with wayne bergeron he was my private teacher at the time and wayne was like dude just like you're gonna play professional if you want to go get a degree in business or something so which was really great advice so what i did is i went to cal state fullerton and I did, I think I only played in the jazz band for like a semester. And then Mark Garibrandt was giving me some lessons on the side at the same time. He was the trumpet professor there. And I told him I wasn't a major in music, but you know, I just wanted to learn as much stuff as possible. And I was pretty serious by like my freshman year in college. Like I knew kind of what was, you know, the vibe that I wanted to go for. So I had the drum and bugle core thing going on, but my main focus was doing original music um you know i as much as i dug doing symphonic band concert band jazz band all that stuff i was more interested in working with like non-trumpet players like doing rock bands and ska bands and reggae bands and like whatever just different things and it wasn't a conscious decision but it's i just knew that i liked doing that and still to this day like that's more what I'm focused on is doing like original projects um, just for a number of things, the, the hang, just the creativity, um, you know, the stress level is different. It's more about being creative and, and figuring out how things work in the ensemble. Um, you know, we'll get into that later, but um, yeah. So, you know, so Wayne had told me to get a business degree. I did that. And then at the time I was just trying to grab lessons with anybody um, you know, I took a couple lessons with Michael McNabb, Dave Washburn, I was with for, for quite a while. And, you know, I'll still call Dave and pick his brain about stuff. And same with Wayne, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then I graduated, I, I took a semester off and went to school at San Francisco State, um, just to kind of get out. And I took jazz band and business law. So I had two classes. <laughs> My parents were like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> needed a break. So, you know, um, yeah, but it's, you know, I finished school and basically, you know, again, doing original music financially takes a long time. So when I graduated, there really wasn't much going on as far as like trumpet income, just because there were certain things that I didn't really want to go do at that time. So for about three years, I just worked a day job um, doing some finance stuff because yeah. do that. Um, and then gradually just got into, got to the point where I was busy enough doing sideman work as well. So, I, you know, I kind of got into the Latin scene, started subbing some, you know, orchestra stuff and, uh, you know, big band, whatever, like wedding gigs, all the kind of usual stuff. And so, yeah, when I was like 24, I think was, was that was it. And then I, I was full time playing and it's been like that ever since. So, um, well one of the things, Sean, I, I, first of all, um, just to, to let's backtrack just a little bit. Yeah. A lot of people think that people in your position or people that of your skill level mm -hmm. don't go through some of the things that we all go through. What were yeah. some of the things as a young player that were you like tough for you? Some of the things like, you know, some people like, well, I wasn't really a great reader or, 
you know, range came hard. Like, what was the some like as a young player in high school and college? What were some things you had to get over? Yeah, absolutely. No, there, definitely a lot of stuff. Um, there was a point, like I said, when I was doing original music, there was probably a point for like three years where I didn't read any music because I didn't have to. Because in a sense of like sight reading, right? You're just in the studio making stuff up. A lot of times you just have it memorized and you just go and record, play. And then, you know, we were doing a lot of gigs as an original band, but you have everything memorized, you know? So I, I'll, I'll never forget when I started, I sat in with a, a really, really good Latin band. And this was Yadi More's band at the time when like Jimmy Branley had moved to town, Luis Erkins also, all these Cuban dudes who like grew up with that stuff or in the band. And it was funny, mom and play. And she called me, she's like, oh, you should, and my mom's a, a piano player. And she was like, you should go check out this band. Like they're really good. And so I checked them out and, and met Luis and, uh, you know, the thickest Cuban accent you can imagine, you know, and I'm like, where are you from, bro? Cuba. So I sat in with those guys and we're going down to read a chart. And mind you, I haven't read music like in three years. And it's like not a clean chart. You know, I'm like, what the hell is going on? So, you know, case in point, you know, my butt got handed to me that night. But uh, so I had to revisit that. And, and, you know, kind of things that I always tell my students that if it's something you really want to fix, you can do it really quickly. So I locked myself in the practice room for like, couple weeks and got everything back. And I just was reading charts, 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 got the visual thing going and it was like, all right, cool. We're good with that. Um, so yeah, that was definitely a thing at some point, you know, the, the one that really jumped out at me, I think is just more like style stuff. Um, and in, in my situation too, thankfully, I don't really remember like anything where like I lost a gig because it was, you know, I wasn't cutting it. It was, you know, something, you know, if I stopped playing with somebody, it was not really something I did for the most part, like kind of like <laughs> more uh, things out of your control, which which is always kind of comforting. But I think for me, I'm always aware of stuff that I need to work on. And the, the thing that always came back to me was style. You know, just if I'm doing a, if I'm playing something, I want to make sure I'm doing the right style. And so I don't know if that was, I wouldn't call it a struggle, but it's something of like the education process that you need to be aware of. And, you know, I, I didn't want to be somebody that was going into a gig and be like, oh, it's, he sounds good, man. He reads the part. It's fine. No. I've always wanted to be like, you sound authentic. Like you really know yeah. your style, whatever it is, like whatever you're into. And, and, and I always tell people too, like, it's totally cool if you're not into a certain style of music. That's, that's fine. Just because it's music doesn't mean it's always going to like perk your interest. Um, but that was something that I, you know, that I dealt with. And, and I still try to think of that to this day. If I'm researching a project, I really want to get not superficial with it, but really down to the nitty gritty kind of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, I think sight reading, with, you know, like we said, I mean, everyone goes through that at some point. Um, I think you know, things that came easy, like, you know, range stuff came easy. But again, it's like, there, I, I tell a lot of people, like, especially when I'm doing master classes, like, go on YouTube, man, you'll see 500 people that can play high Gs and high double Cs. But the guys that have the style are the ones that are working. And so I think, you know, unfortunately, there, this idea of like, the more chops you have, more talented you are but yeah that's really a big that's a big myth it's a huge myth <laughs> yeah, it really, um it, it really is yeah. we all day talking about it but it, it, when you have the right style that's the idea you know and, and most of my work like the last few years has been like just for the most part like sax trumpet and trombone just like a three-piece horn section so the tenor player and trombone player could give a crap if you could play high G's, <laughs> you know, like they want it to be in tune and stylistically accurate. They don't want you playing so to compete. Like there's a lot of that that just comes. And that took me a long time to figure out too, you know, 
I mean, I know how I played in high school and college and, yeah. you know, I hear tapes now and I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> you know? So I think that's like kind of the never ending struggles, just kind of figuring out like what you want to sound like. And, uh, and you actually, this is another good thing. Um, when we're talking about things you deal with, it takes a long time to get to the point to where you're comfortable admitting like what you can't do as well as other people. Um, and that just kind of comes with like trying to crush your ego and, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, friends with some world-class orchestral players and, you know, I, I'll go in and sub with an orchestra and I think I do a fine job, but I forget that those guys, because they're really good friends of mine, are so amazing at it. I'm just like, yeah. oh yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, same reason. I'd rather, like me, I sold my pick a couple of years ago because is yeah. I'd rather give it to someone who can do that stuff, you know? Right. Right. I, yeah, it's just like, I, I get called once or twice a year for it. I might yeah. as well just give the gig to someone else. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's you know that can be that can actually be kind of liberating too because, um, you know you kind of decide like what you want to focus on and and all that kind of stuff. So, you know it's everyone's different. You know, so I think you just have to be true to yourself on that. You know, or you just like, yeah, I can't do this, and I'm going to keep on practicing it until I can. I mean, there's something really beautiful in that as well. That you can kind of go after so well, one of the things i really like about your the way you went with your playing sean and i think a lot of teachers don't talk about this with their students is that you know we're taught you got to be able to read what's on the page you got to be able to solo like lee morgan you got to be able to you know this that but a lot of teachers kind of shun the band thing like mm -hmm. joining a band or doing original stuff Right. You know, it's like, well, you're not going to be a success unless you're, you know, just a, a hired gun type thing. And that's not true. Some of the greatest trumpet players are guys that just played in bands all their life. Sure. And, and so I, one of the things I want to ask you is when you, when you thought, I really like original music, man, how did you make that happen as far as saying, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. How do I go find that? And how do I make that something I can actually rely on? and right. build upon yeah well you know it started in high school um actually you know what i lie i started in junior high i think my first band was in junior high and we just got together and we're like jamming you know and it was i'm sure an unmitigated disaster but it was fun you know we just had a great time like in you know my buddy's garage um and then in high school i was doing like a cover band and this group called bulkhead and i'll never forget it's a, it was actually a really great band. And, and funny enough, like the drummer, Adam Watts, who's still a friend of mine, he to this day is one of the best drummers I've ever worked with. And, and he still plays, but he went on to like write the theme to high school musical for Disney. And he's just like, you know, big shot songwriter now, right. You know, and he deserves everything he got. So I never, I'll never forget, man. It was a cover band and I showed up because I had met the sax player who's still a dear friend of mine. And uh, he was like, yeah, just show up. We were playing this restaurant in Mission Viejo. And uh, he's like, yeah, just show up next week, man. And we'll just, we'll kind of play. So I'm thinking like there'll be music or something, no charts. It's like, but it's every typical, like, you know, pop band, you know. So the first tune they call is like Jungle Boogie. And he's like, you know, Jungle Boogie? I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, <laughs> I didn't know any of the tunes, you know. So long story short, you know, I kind of like took some and whatever and but then went back and learned all the tunes you know so it's like in high school I kind of you know I'd already er learned some Earth, Wind and & Fire and some Michael Jackson and you know some Sinatra stuff that you would do kind of on casuals but the the point of where I'm kind of going with that band we started doing some original stuff and you know it was always just fun because we were always doing gigs like we'd just go out and play wherever did that a couple of years and then, you know, I joined a ska band and then I know Saito's on here. I, Steve was in a band called Freak Daddy and I took over, I think if, if Steve's correct, I took over for him at some point um, and did that band for a couple of years, you know, worked some original stuff. I never, I don't think I ever recorded with them. I was kind of like in this transition period with the band and the band broke up after that. But from there, I went to this band called Aphrodisiac. Um, or natural aphrodisiac, which was a band that was like my first real 
like experience of like writing parts and, and just the whole creative thing. We did three records together and how did, I mean, we were busy, like we were doing some touring and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that is, is, I think I learned from a young age that everything's gonna stop at some point. And so doing original bands where you only not do it for a year and then you go do something else and you do something else, um, that really helped me understand that whatever gig I get, there will be a time when I'm no longer in it. Whether I, I've, you know, I'm not gonna quit something, but the band falls apart or you get fired for whatever reason, it doesn't work out. Like that mentality has always been in the back of my head. So when things do stop, for me personally, it's okay. Like I'm, you know, I might be bummed or whatever, but I'm, I'm right on to the next thing. And so with Aphrodisiac, um, you know, we had those illusions of like, dude, this, this might be it. Like no. the music industry hadn't really changed yet. Like there were still those opportunities of, you know, getting demo deals and, and doing some touring and things like that. Um, you know, I think we talked to a couple major labels at one point. And again, it was kind of always the, the, the thing there of like ska music and that swing revival was really big for like nine months. And then after, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And after that, like if you were a band that had horns, you're like automatically a ska band or a swing band. Yeah. You know, you know, and we were doing this interview for, I forget who it was. And the guy was just like, was like, yeah, so like, you know, what kind of ska bands do you like? And I was like, have you even listened to what we sound like? And we're like more of like an old Santana kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was just like, these guys are idiots. <laughs> like, yeah. what kind of, you know, the alarm bells were going. But um, yeah, and so after Aphrodisiac, I think I'd gotten the Setzer gig, right? after that like i was kind of doing playing with natural aphrodisiac doing some teaching a lot of latin work in town like that was kind of like four nights a week you know so i mean i was everything was cool like and so when i was offered this setzer gig um that would have been like yeah like 13 or 14 years ago so yeah that that sounds right time wise wow so one thing i one thing too I, I want to commend you on is a lot of people in our industry kind of look down upon the Latin music sure. because of the, you know, some of the business stuff is not, you know, whatever. But yeah. I say this, I tell my students this, I'm like, look, I'm a Latino. And as long as there's a weekend, they're always going to party and you're always going to have a gig. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, I paid, I paid my mortgage just on Latin gigs, you know. Um, Likewise. Same way, man. Yeah. No, I, I tell people, I I'm I'm in the same camp as you. Um, first of all, for me, like I, I mentioned, I I moved around a lot as a kid. I lived in Brazil for five years as a kid, so I was kind of. I mean, not that Brazilian music is Afro-Cuban. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Yeah, that's like my biggest pet peeve musically. I don't really have many pet peeves, but. Like sambas for big band, I'll I'll just walk out. I'm like, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> like, you guys are missing the whole point. Um, no, for me, I always was interested in Latin music, and and honestly, like in high school, like that, I was an Arturo guy, man. Like when we had our trumpet heroes, it was like, what the hell is going on with this guy? You know? So no, I mean, I'm I tell all my students, especially if you're living on the West Coast or if you're in the Southwest, um, you know, all the big gigs, every single one of them um, is because of doing Latin bands. Um, I got the Setzer gig because I was doing a bunch of gigs just the previous few months with Sal Crackiolo. Oh, yeah. And so they actually, they offered the gig to Sal first, but I can't, I can't remember if he was still doing Poncho at the time or if he was doing Tower yet. I forget the idea, yeah. but Sal and I were working against a lot together. So he was like, no, I can't do it, but call Sean. That's how I got it, like yeah. directly from a Latin band. And then when I started working with Gloria Trevi and Alejandro Guzman and Joan Sebastian, those are all three, you know, huge Mexican singers. Yeah. Um, that was all because of the salsa scene, because they would hire the big Latino pop bands from the salsa scene, you know. Right. Um, so no, and even like the 
you know, I did the Academy Awards this year with, uh, with Elton John and Ron Blake put that together. I met Ron doing salsa gigs. So I, I tell all my students, you've got to learn that stuff because I think what happens is we think that American music is like the only popular music. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let me tell you, there's a lot of countries in the, in the country, in the world that speak Spanish and like all their pop music has horns in it, you know? Right. So um, yeah, no, I'm the complete opposite. Now, if you don't like that music, don't do it. Yeah. For me, I always liked it. So it wasn't like, I'm going to do this because I know I'll get these other gigs. I just always found it a great combination of harmony, rhythm. Obviously, you're as, as far as like trumpet music, you're not going to get more challenged than playing some of that Afro-Cuban stuff, um, without a doubt, you know. And also, too, I like to travel. So yeah. that style of music is me is, you know, forced me to travel all around the world, which I'm very grateful for. Well, and just a side note, you know, Sean, I think you would concur with me when I say, you know, it takes a lot of technique to play that stuff, and it takes a lot of chops. Yeah. You know? And uh, you know, that type of stuff, you know, I mean, it's just a lot of people don't see the musical value in it, but there is, I mean, it's, it's tough. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and you got to have, you know, you got to have technique and you got to have chops to play. So, oh, yeah. No, it's, I've, I've seen dudes fold that are amazing players. <laughs> I'm just laughing. You're just like, damn, dude. <laughs> you know, you're just like, I thought you'd last at least two songs, but, you know, like, yeah, it's, it can be fun. And it's, you know, it's always a party when you're doing that. Yeah. It's good, you know? And that's how um, my current band, Jungle Fire, started is, you know, kind of meeting some guys in that scene. And then, you know, that kind of came together. But yeah, no, I, I tell people, man, if you, if you want to start working, right away and you want to be consistent like the latin scene there's definitely an opportunity no it's funny you know I, I i never did mariachi that's that's not my thing but like speaking of like work my friends who do mariachi during the the lock have been working all oh, yeah. like yeah they're like yeah bro like i don't know a couple gigs a day i'm like yeah. Wait, what you know yeah yeah so, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity for it, and and again, like I said, um, I I try to tell my private students that, like, you know, there, you got to be able to judge when a gig is worth doing, but most of the time, I I, I tell people like ninety nine percent of the time, when you're younger, just say yes to everything because you never know who's going to be on the gig, um, you never know who's going to be listening. Um, you know, I, I, I know a few times that, like I was doing some random gig and somebody was in the audience that kind of dug what I was doing and that led to some recordings or whatever. So, you know, you can't, you, you can't be picky, you know, in the beginning. Um, even now I try not to be that guy, you know, it's like I try to do, but I like to play, like I like to play trumpet. So it's like, I'm going to, if I'm available, I'll probably say yes to it unless it's something that I experienced before that I don't want to do again. <laughs> well, you know? to quote your you know, former teacher, Wayne, he, I've heard him say many times, don't turn on a gig. It's just experience when you're young. It's just experience, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, like, I mean, yeah. I've been on situations where some heavy cats are on there and they're like, oh, I don't just, you know, a lame gig, blah, 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 whatever. And then, and then we play something and then like stylistically, it's not accurate. You know, they're, we're doing some pop stuff and they want to throw like a bebop line over it like and you're like no dude <laughs> like i get it <laughs> um so yeah so you're right it's it's that experience that you get and then when you do get a little bit older then you can be like kind of you know how to handle things and and there's so much more involved besides just the music i mean especially when you start getting on the road like you can get fired for most of the time guys get fired from gigs it's not because of the the way they play it's the personality thing yeah you know, i would say most of the time it's that so well uh, to quote the first of all that's um that that's some great advice and uh steve said i'll just say this he just to quote steve i i said good to hear your story and passion for original music so steve just wanted me to relay that to you nice thank you so but uh you know one of the things i heard a lot about you sean and i, I we've never met in person and hopefully <laughs> that can change but um, one of the things I've heard from a lot of our mutual friends 
is that you're so easy to work with. You're so easy to work with. You're, and um, let's talk about the Setzer gig. Sure. You know, the, 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 and the, the thing is, I hear a lot of people, you either love it to death or it's not for you. You know, right. um, so, but the thing is, is like you said, you know, when they're, when you guys go out for Christmas and it's that whole month, one of the things I hear a lot from the guys on the band that are my friends and yours is that you're just this great guy. You know, you're just a great guy to hang out with. You're great to talk to, but can you talk about, first of all, what the book entails? Like what, what's, what is, re sorry, forgive me. Uh, okay. What is, um, what is, what is requested, what is required of you from the book? And again, what kind of person you have to be to stay on that band? Sure. Yeah. Um, so when I started, um, I forget the year it would have been, maybe 06 or 07. I'd, I'd have to look. I don't know. Um, I came over, uh, there was a pretty big change in the trumpet section. Um, There's basically three spots open. Um, before, like Willie was still in the band, Willie Murillo, and he had left. And I think Bob Bennett had left. I forget who else was doing it. It might've been Kai Palmer at the time. I can't remember. I talked with Willie and he jugged my memory. But so Steve Reed was on the lead chair. And then I came in with Brian Scanlon and Jamie Havorka. And so mm -hmm. it was it was great because it was like, it was a basically a trumpet section of four lead trumpet players. And at that time, if you haven't heard Steve play, I mean, he's a freak of nature. Yeah. So Steve, Bay, I mean, he did pretty much everything. And then I think I played a couple lead tunes and I think same with Jamie and, and Brian, you know, but Steve is, is just an anomaly, you know, <laughs> and it's kind of like, yeah, he's dude. A monster, man. Yeah, it's, it's pretty yeah. amazing. Um, and so at that time, my responsibilities weren't that crazy. I had a couple tunes, um, but if you're talking part wise, like there's some legitimate crazy stuff on there. Um, I mean, you definitely need a really consistent working high A, B flat, B for sure. Like it's written in the parts and things are voiced that way. Um, so yeah, <laughs> there's, there's that kind of thing. And we had, that was, that will go down as like one of my all time favorite trumpet sections to play with. It was, we just all got along really well. It was a big party. Um, it was a lot of work. We, you know, going to Japan and a lot of cool stuff. It was just great. It was just show up, do your gig, you know, kind of play your ass off and, and everything would be cool. Um, at that time, again, let's kind of move along quicker. It was that for a couple of years, Steve got the Prince gig. So Steve left to go do Prince's band. I kind of jumped over um, and then Blackwell came on at that time, James Blackwell. So then it was Scanlon, James, myself, and I think Ron Blake was kind of doing most of it, um, you know, whenever he wasn't doing Poncho. And so at that time, you know, we were kind of talking earlier, um, we kind of split the book up evenly um, for the sole fact of like, we didn't want anybody to be like sitting on a third book or a fourth book for like six weeks, getting back into town and then having to go do like a lead trumpet gig and just being like totally out of shape. You know, it's like, it's not cool. Like, and there's no reason for that. We wanted to, we wanted to kind of stay in shape, have a good time and and not get bored. You know, I mean, if you're playing fourth all day long, you'd be like, ooh, can I do something? <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, yeah, but again, like I, I should have thought it through more. You know, I ended up getting some of Steve's old parts that were you know, the double D crap and you're just like, yeah. all right, maybe it'll come out tonight. You know, <laughs> you know but it was great though. Cause I, I, I was playing on pretty big equipment back then. Um, and when I joined Jamie, Brian and Steve both played much smaller stuff that I was playing, but they were, you mean getting massive sounds and, and just playing at night. So I kind of made a conscious effort that I was like, all right, I'm going to try to go smaller and, uh, you know, to see where I can get to it. And all th those three guys are really, really helpful to this day. Like we all kind of, you know, swap ideas and all that kind of stuff of seeing 
what you could do. And, and, and I got to the spot, like I couldn't play as small as like what Brian and Steve were doing, but yeah. I definitely got to where I could play smaller and it made, um, when I would hear myself back, it sounded better. Um, you know, the sound was a little bit clearer and, and I could focus more again on the style of the music and not like just trying to make the notes come out, you know? Right, just trying to get through it. Yeah, I was like, okay, finally I can play. Now I gotta figure out how I want it to sound like. Um, yeah, so I mean, I always enjoyed the book. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's it's a hard book for sure, but I never, you know, minus if we're doing like a TV thing or something, like I never felt like a pressure of like, okay, if you if you miss a note, you know, you're gonna get a talking to tomorrow or something like that. And I, from day one, I actually had a really good relationship with Brian, the boss. We got along from day one and, you know, it was cool. Like we'd always talk and, and hang and, and yeah, it was, it was fine. So that, that's my experience, you know? Yeah. And like I said, the thing before is that a lot of, again, for a lot of the, the young kids that do watch this, I, I got a lot of, and debunking myth is kind of my thing on this thing. Okay. Cause there's a lot of, you know, the old school teachers that are teaching the young kids now. Yeah. The, the, the same etiquette things aren't the same anymore. You know, like the lead player does all that. No, like in LA, Wayne passes, you pass, all the greats pass. Sure. You know? And uh, I think that's a, a big thing that a lot of young players don't understand is that they feel that they have to, especially if they're sitting in the hot seat, right. that they can't delegate the responsibility to a qualified, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so well, that's another thing too. Also, let's talk about this. I, I'm getting I'm getting questions, uh, Sean. And uh, if it's if it's cool, can we, can we can we answer some of these questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So this is uh, from Mark. Mark is a buddy of mine out of Pittsburgh, and mm -hmm. um, and Mark asks. He says, he says, Sean, when you're on a high profile gig, mm -hmm. okay, what is your mindset going into something like that, not knowing what you're gonna see? Right. Um, you know, my, my take on it, like kind of working with um, like some students and maybe going through like some anxiety things or just kind of developing. For me personally, I know it's just repetition. If I'm doing something, it doesn't have to be the same thing, but if I'm in an environment where I'm doing it consistently, it's fine. You know, um, you get, you just get used to it. Um, as far as preparing for that, so say, you know, you're working towards this goal of something, um, you just have to put yourself in an element practice wise that can duplicate it as much as possible. And I don't think there's anything that does it quite that way, but you have to do that, whether it be, um, you know, sight reading something in your studio and you, you know, you read it top to bottom and you know mistakes and all um that gives you a good you know kind of idea of what to expect um you know i always have people like if they're if they feel like they get nervous on something i'll make them do like you know 30 push-ups and then immediately <laughs> and play the solo because the heart's like boom, 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 you know yeah. like, dude it's not going to be that bad you know but i mean i've done you know and I, I'd, I'd be sitting here lying if i said like we weren't nervous like doing TV spots because, you know, as a kid, you could go play something and mess up, it's done, you know? But nowadays, like every person has a cell phone in your face, you know, it's on TV forever. And so you just try to get to the point where you're like, dude, like no matter how good I play it, there's gonna be some dupe, some person that's be like, well, I wouldn't have played it like that. Some you know? troll, yeah. yeah. And you're like, all right, ouch commando, I get it. But, you know, um, so that's, I mean, it's, I don't think that's like the, a great answer, but that's just kind of how I prepare for it. And just putting yourself in those elements, um, you know, like when I got the Jawan gig with John Sebastian, that, that's a good example because there was no rehearsal. And the first show we did was like 20,000 people. Wow. And I, I had to sight read the gig. But I had done so much of that music that by the time I got there, it was kind of like, all right, we're just reading another chart, you know, and and you kind of, 
except there might be something we, you know, maybe a couple things that are off, but it, you know, it goes well. And, and one thing I noticed too, uh, a lot of the stuff that we hear in our own playing, most other people don't, you know, you think everyone's going to be hyperactive and like, Oh, did, you know, what did you, you know, you played that slur, you know, not like it sounded on the piano. And, and a lot of times they don't hear it, you know, um, so I, you know, I try to keep that in mind, but I think it's just preparing whatever it is you want to do. You got to do it over and over and over again. And, and just know that even guys that maybe you're working for the first time that are super confident, they were in a position too one day where they're like, well, what am I doing? You know, like, you know, nervous or whatever. So that's kind of my take on it. Um, you know, my buddy, Eric Javel is a good analogy. He's just like, it's not like you're going to die if you make a bad note. You know? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's kind of a good point. You know? yeah. So, yeah. Um, so hopefully, Mark, that answers your question. But I mean, it's it's just trying to put yourself in those environments um, and just playing and practicing as much as possible. And, you know, Dave Washburn had a really good quote about that when I was studying with him. He was like, you don't want to go into a gig like at when you're not at that level yet. You know, it's like, it's okay to wait a couple of years before you sub in some big band or some uh, orchestra. He's like, you don't want to go in and not do the best job. Like, you don't want to go in and just not be at that level because right. it's a long time for those people to forget about it. You know, yeah. um, I've seen guys move to town that are like all gung-ho, like, oh man, I should, you know, I should be doing this and be, okay, cool. Well, let's try you on something. And then you'll get a text from the band leader and be like, yeah, dude, don't send that guy again. Wow. It's like that time is gone. It's like, oh, well, maybe that guy should have been a little bit more aware of kind of where you're at talent wise before you're you're jumping on something, you know. So I think, you know, that's really important too, is just being really realistic of what you're capable of, you know. Yeah. This is a uh, great, great answer, by the way. Um this is uh from Jack. Jack's a buddy of mine out of New York City. Oh, nice. He says, uh, Sean, I love your work with Brian Setzer, great sound, love your sound. Is it true that LA is the type of town that if you make one mistake, you're gone and you're forgotten about? <laughs> uh, and if so, if that is true, what can you do to either hide those mistakes and, yeah. or what can you do to kind of correct that type of, um, that type of opinion of people who have that about you, uh, that first opinion, that first impression? Yeah. I'm trying to make sense because it's in Spanish, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd be lying if I said that there aren't situations like that, yeah. where, um, especially, I think that's coming from non trumpet players. Um, I think that the trumpet players that get to the, the very top level that we all love and respect, I think everyone's pretty understanding of like, there will be mistakes, you know, I mean, We've seen all the amazing guys, you know, chip a note here or there. So I, I, I don't think in the trumpet community that's much of an issue, um, in my experience. And if guys act like that, you don't want to be around them anyways. <laughs> but I mean, I remember, you know, the first time I got to work with Malcolm McNabb, and you know, just ready to crap my pants, and <laughs> and he was as, as sweet as can be to me. You know, I mean, I. Um, and so that was really comforting that, you know, someone at that level, you know, would be understanding of, of kind of what's going on. But yeah, it, you know, I have a couple composers that I work for that I do some contracting for. Mm -hmm. They might be like, no, man, like, what's up with that guy? And, you know, it's like, I'm like, dude, just give him a break. Like, come on. Like, <laughs> like, it's easy when it's on MIDI keyboard, you know? So yeah, I would say sometimes it could be not in the trumpet community. Um, but someone else that and it's not just going after trouble players, like they just, you know, don't understand the limitations of an instrument or, but again, when you get the composers that are at the, the amazing level, they're totally understanding. Um, you know, I, I sub for Wayne and Joey Sellers, uh, jazz aggregation, which I mean, Joe is like one of the most brilliant composers alive and his, his book is so challenging. Um, but I mean, Joey knows that there's gonna be like, 
there's dudes that have been in the band for like 20 years and there's still mistakes on the concert, <laughs> you know? So he totally, he's that person he understands, you know? Yeah. So yeah, so that's, that's kind of my take on it. Um, a way to hide it, just blame the other person. <laughs> it wasn't me, it was Wayne, it was Wayne. <laughs> yeah. um, actually Wayne, Wayne did something funny. We were like, this is years ago. We were, we were doing this session for this video game called Wild Star. So the trumpet yeah. section, me, myself, Malcolm was playing principal. I think Barry Perkins was on there too. So the four of us. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah it that's a great section, man. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. There's actually some really cool footage that the composer put on YouTube. I'll send it to you. I, I didn't know it was on there. But it was really funny. We, I think we were, we were at Sony Studios or, yeah, we were at Sony. And Malcolm, Malcolm was, something was like bugging him from a different session. And so we had a question about the music and Wayne was like, Malcolm, he's like, can you ask him about this? And, and Malcolm was like, no, I'm, I'm not asking. Like, I don't feel like it. Or you know, like, he was like, I don't want to get in trouble or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> Wayne raises his hand and the composer, Jeff Kurtnacker is like, yeah, Wayne, what's up? And he's like, Malcolm wants to know if this. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. That's great. Um, I was saying my go-to though, like if something, if we mess something up, and uh, and they'll be like, oh, can you guys? What's up with that? I'd be like, oh, let it. Let me just try it a different way. You know, that works good. You know, that's just, awesome. That's great advice. I, so I got a I got a, a question from Steve. Steve Sidow. Uh Any certain tricks or techniques that those guys shared that helped with playing chops, etc., on the sensor band? Yeah. So um, I think we all kind of played the same way. It was just kind of like conceptually kind of what we're going after. Um, like we all had kind of different sound concepts. And so, we, which is cool because like is a section, I'm not a fan of like everyone playing the same trumpet and the same, yeah. it's, it's like, it, go play a MIDI keyboard. Yeah. So we all kind of had like a different vibe, which is really cool. So Steve had, which I tell people, when you're downsizing a mouthpiece, um, he said like, just for like three days, don't even try to play loud or high notes, just really soft playing, air attacks, light tonguing, just to kind of get it going and kind of get naturally acclimated to it. Um, one thing you can do too, is kind of play with a mute, like put in practice mute or something. I mean, I hate playing with practice mutes, but when I was downsizing a little bit, I, I would put one in, play with it, so it just feels horrible take the mute out and play. And it's like, oh, okay, this actually feels pretty good. And uh, and also too, like being on the road, we had time to kind of experiment. Um, but yeah, I I do have some, I'm happy to like email anybody that wants like some notes or stuff on doing that. Um, but it's just kind of, again, when you're messing around with equipment, know that certain things might take time. like. I switched over to a different B flat during the the uh, the lockdown, and you know the first week I was like ah, I'm not really into this. Um, I ended up I got a first generation Bobby shoe, which I can tell you five years ago I, I wouldn't be able to play it like it's way too small for me whatever. But I just played bought one played it and now it feels great and it's like it sounds just like I did on my Calicchio. So yeah. you know because I have that sound in my head and you just kind of figure it out. And I think no matter what you're playing on, eventually you will sound like you, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And again, it was uh, always kind of just thinking about the music and, and kind of getting through it, you know, but, and also accepting it's different. Like I can't play on what Steve plays and I can't play on what Brian plays, you know, like they're like, Oh, this is too, for me, it's like too small. And then they'll play my horn and they're like, you're an idiot, dude. Like, this is so big. I'm like, what are you talking uh, about? You know, so like everyone's different. Yeah. But, yeah. but um, you know, as far as if we want to talk like trumpety kind of things, um, you know, I'm a Maggio guy. Uh did, I, yeah. yeah, Schlossberg, like um, you know, I was I was really fortunate I got to study with Winton um a handful of times uh when I was in New York and then back when he was on the road out here. And you know, he's like, man, you know, Clark Book, Schlossberg, Arvins. He's like everything else is just kind of an offshoot of it, you know? Yeah. And, um, but yeah, but always, always go after the sound. Um, if it's something that 
is not agreeing with your sound, then I, I would say skip it, you know, and, and you should know pretty quickly if it's something you could kind of deal with. But also too, don't be neurotic about it. A lot of guys get neurotic, like they'll play one note and they're like, oh, you know, I can't, you know, this isn't the sound I want. It's like, we'll, we'll change it and fix it, you know, do something. And, and just kind of like, don't expect overnight results. Um, right. You know, like, I think if, if you're kind of in that mindset, you, you know, it's going to be more on the disappointing side. I, I think anything you do really, but, um, you know, I had, I had a really great student. Um, he just graduated high school and I, I mean, I'm not joking when he was a freshman, I mean, crushing everything up to double D like, I remember his first lesson. I was like, what in the hell are you doing? <laughs> it was incredible. And, you know, but there was, he was raw and there was definitely some work, you know, that he wanted to work on. It's like, cool, man, we got, we got four years to get you. So you're reading big band charts. I'm like, you're not going to need those notes 99.9% .9 of the time. Yeah. Let's make it so you're good up to high F and you can sight read your, your butt off. And this is our plan. And Kind of going from there so you know so i think the i think in the long term is is kind of is the way i approach it and we, and we all did with sensor you know but then with that being said we're still texting each other every day like dude <laughs> but you know like just bought this mouthpiece just bought this horn you're like oh god shut <laughs> i got another question from josh josh is a buddy of mine out of florida he asked uh nice. john what advice would you give to someone who's reading building their chops someone who's blowing out their chops on a on a on a on a, on a tour and sure. now it's time to rebuild how would you go about rebuilding yeah so that's a great question um i know james blackwell wrote like a kind of like a comeback trumpet player book which had some really good stuff in there i'd say check that out um i haven't actually gone through it mm -hmm. but you know james he knows what he's talking about. But for me, I'm a big, well, let me say this. I'm a big proponent of mouthpiece buzzing, but in short increments. So um, I do Jim Thompson's mouthpiece buzzing basics every day. Um, but I only do three exercises and it takes, if I do it back to back with breaks, it takes like nine minutes and 12 seconds. I think I, I timed it for like my younger students. I'm like, dude, even you have nine minutes a day like to do this yeah. for, for me i know i can do that and it's just it's basically schlossberg you're just kind of starting on a middle g you go up to middle c then you do the d d uh, uh, da, e, those exercises and that alone makes me feel the same every day like if i play a lot the night before um you know i, I kind of follow bobby shoes teaching i do a lot of the lip flapping um but I don't like to do a big warm up, just because I live in a town where there is an insane amount of traffic and I don't have the time to do it. And so it's just practicality. But I did help a friend of mine come back chop wise and we did the mouthpiece buzzing stuff. And he definitely came back because it's it's all about that response. Um, so I would say that and you, you can totally give him, Josh, you can give him my email. I'll, I'll pass all this stuff along to him. Um, I think pianissimo air attacks every day are really important. Malcolm would always talk about that mm -hmm. just to kind of get the air going and the response. Um, and long as there's like no, I mean, if there's lip damage, um, you know, that's one thing, like you, maybe you do need to lay off for a while, but if you're just coming back and, you know, you kind of get, you're out of shape or you can been beaten up from a tour or whatever. Um, a lot of soft playing. Um, I don't, you know, I recommend, like there's times when I'll just not work on my upper register for like a week if I don't have to, because it's, I, I try to treat this part like an athlete would. Yeah. And, you know, you see guys like the LeBron James who are still like amazing at an older age for what they do. And I try to duplicate that of like treating yourself as an athlete and making sure the muscles are taken care of and you're not doing anything stupid for me. I, and I only can speak to me personally, but air attacks, the buzzing, um, just having those fundamentals. I do fundamentals every day. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with a couple guys in town, you know, other pro players are having issues about something and, 
you're like, all right, cool, man. Let, let me hear you just do this lip slur. And they can't even do a, a basic lip slur because they've been so pounded. It sounds like they've been powerlifting for, you know, 50 years or something like that. So coming back to those basic fundamentals, I think are really, really important. Um, and you can do some other stuff, you know, like isometric exercises. If, you, if you're dealing with something like not necessarily the lip, um, yeah. I think Scott Engelbright hit me up to the facial flex, which is like that thing they sell for old ladies on like QVC where they can like squeeze a, a bar in here, but it works these muscles out. It works great. Like it's a, it's a great corners thing. Um, and speaking of that, like a lot of my students, I notice that there's running into an issue of like them overblowing or just something not happening. A lot of times it's their, their corners aren't tight enough. So <clears throat> I would say like the buzzing, um, uh, what else did I say? Air attacks, uh, some is isometric stuff. Um, I know some guys are not into buzzing. They like to do lead pipe buzzing. That's great too. Like I, I kind of take a combination of everything. Um, <clears throat> I would just say if someone's like, you have to do this, take it with a grain of salt, you know, yeah. um, but that's, that works for me. So um, again, we can trade emails and chat about it, but I find that really, really beneficial. And, uh, I know some, you know, I, I think there was this myth about <clears throat> doing mouthpiece buzzing, like making your range kind of drop. But for me, it went up when I started doing it. Um, and just everything started locking in better too. But again, I, I do play with a really open aperture. So for me, like I, I can't really free buzz that well. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't free buzz with the aperture that I used to play. So I have to adjust it. Same reason is like, I'm not good at buzzing like above like an E above middle C because I play so open yeah. that just, I feel like I have to use a lot of pressure. So I really just buzz in the low register. Um, and then the only thing I change when I go high is the airspeed, you know? So um, that's kind of like my chop thing that works works for me. So hopefully that answers that question, but I definitely started with the buzzing. That kind of rocks, I think. Cool, this is uh, from Kyle from Kansas City. And yeah, Sean, when you're out, when you're playing with the Brian Setz Orchestra and you have to have that big, huge sound and you're screaming up in the heavens <laughs> and you're playing outside at a db level at 100 yeah how do you last the gig sure um you know roger ingram talks about this in his book and i think it's the best i've seen him someone talk about it but you just you have to trust your projection um and and that's a direct quote from roger and i'll never forget i was doing the stan kenton alumni band with him and i was playing second he was playing lead and I, I'll never forget, like I turned to Roger during the rehearsal and I was like, dude, am I playing too loud? Because like I felt like I was playing louder than Roger. And he just kind of looked at me, he's like, no, man, you're good. And I was like, okay, cool. He's like, thanks for asking, you know, and one of the sweetest guys on the planet. And then, so I was like, okay, cool. So that night I walked in and we were playing in a big hall, I forget where it was. And I walked in through the back and he was warming up on stage and it was like the loudest goddamn thing I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> Wow. And I was like, oh God, I'm just getting buried up there, I bet. So it's knowing that your trumpet really projects. And I know some guys, um, if it's crazy loud, sometimes I'll put in one earplug. I don't like to play with earplugs, but sometimes I'll do one just so I can hear kind of the, the vibrations that I got going on, uh, you know, my lips and kind of gets it in there. Um, yeah, that's just kind of the idea. I just try not to overdo it. I just try to kind of back off a little bit. That's that's one thing Wayne had always tried to get had to get me to do when I started studying with him. I was just playing too much, you know. But then again, I did grow up playing outdoors, like doing drum corps and marching band. So from you know, it's not really that big of a deal for kind of outside. It's kind of like whatever, you know, we're going for it. Um, but for someone that doesn't have that experience just back off a little bit, you know, like that whole 80% mentality, like you're playing at your 80% volume. So if you do kick it up to 90, it's like, whoa, you know, but you want your 80% to be 100% of what's needed for the gig, you know? Um, yeah, so 
that's that's kind of the vibe. Also, too, you know, with Setzer, we all we're all mic'd, so um, you know, we we do have that going for us. But then again, Brian's playing through two giant guitar amps, so yeah. <laughs> I don't think our mics are really doing anything. <laughs> That's that's a big thing. I mean, especially like when I do um, with my band with Jungle Fire, th that book's really hard too. I actually, I'm I get more tired in that band than I do with Setzer. And it's I mean it's not nearly the range thing, but it's just it's on your face the entire time. And we when we play live, we treat the shows as a DJ set, so we segue from each tune, so there's no breaks. Oh, wow. So literally just playing the whole time. So that's that's a really good example of like learning how to pace yourself and like, you know, cause I've had buddies come in and sub and then, you know, they'll call me. I'm like, yo, how'd it go, man? And they're like, dude, I was, I was out by like the third tune, you know, and yeah. you know, they think they can crush it the whole time. So yeah, yeah it's, it's just really learning about pacing and, uh, and that's kind of what I do. So yeah, I think if you're outside also to know that like when you play outside acoustically, your sound is going to get really, um, that's the word I'm looking for, but it's just going to spread and you're not going to hear it. You know, it's not like you're playing in a great big hall that's, you know, indoors where the sound's going to reverberate. The sound basically goes out and then that's it. So, um, you know, yeah. yeah. I got yeah. another, uh, and Sean, I apologize, man. I know we're, we're almost out of time here, but I just. I'm, I I literally have nothing going on. We can go as long as we want. Just... <laughs> okay, no, man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got, I got two, I got first quick. This is from Cynthia. She says, I'm just beginning to play pop music uh -huh. and I'm finding out that I'm tiring out after the third set. I'm playing so loud that I can barely hear myself or I play so loud, but I can barely hear myself. I think it goes back to what you were just saying. She goes, yeah. when you play, when you play a large venue or when you play a pop tune, do you use a sound back? Yeah. Okay. Those are great. Those are great. And I've never had an issue with like somebody saying um, like, like a production person, you know, that likes the choreography person being like, what is that? You know, can we, can we get rid of that? Um, yeah, those are awesome. I will say that when I bought it, I hated it to begin with um, cause it was so much, but then, um, then I got used to it and it, it was great. Yeah. I totally recommend those. They're really, really really nice especially if you're trying to compete man with like a guitar player a you know drum set keyboards all that stuff um it's it's way more efficient and also too man like you can play more musically when you have that yeah. um because you can hear yourself especially and i just you know unless i'm in europe working because I, I go to europe a couple times a year to, to do some touring the sound engineers over there are amazing, like amazing. And I don't need the sound back there because I can actually have the monitors work. You know, in the States, not so much, man. Like, yeah. it's, it's kind of like, so I just kind of gave up, you know, so like, I'll do a sound check and guys like, do what, what do you want in your monitor? I'm like, just turn it off, man. I got, I got my sound back. I'm good. So yeah, for her, I would, I would definitely recommend that. Um, you know, because a lot, the people that hire us, a lot of them aren't trumpet players. So they're not going to understand why you sounded great in the beginning, but then at the end of the gig on the third set and you got some big solo and you just, you kind of fold, um, you know, I mean, we get it. It's like, we understand why, but um, a lot of people don't. So whatever advantage you can do to negate that hundred percent. So yeah, the sound back is, is awesome. So, and yes, I've lost yeah. 10 of them. So. <laughs> Are they Still in production, the guy, the fire extinguisher guy, is he still making them? The guy? No, as far as I know, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think, okay. yeah, I, I think so. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the worst man. Like, how many Harmon mutes I've left at gigs, music stands. Like, I'm just like, I just, I've accepted the fact that I do that. This <laughs> <laughs> is like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. So this is a, my buddy Chris. Chris is from Selma. Oh, he's in close to my hometown. Okay, so so Chris asks, "Hey, <clears throat> Sean, big fan." Oh, thanks, Sean. I saw, and we talked about this last week when I was uh, the week before with Seraphine. 
he saw you on the Audio Technica website when you're demoing the mic. Oh, yeah. mic right. He goes, is that the mic you use to record now again? Or do you record with something else? What do you use? What mic do you use to record with? Yeah, so um, so I, I have a studio here at my house. Um, and then I have another studio that I'm partners with, with the guys in my band. And um, so here, I, get it. I actually just got this one. Um, can you see? Yeah. yeah, this is great. It's, um, it's a Vanguard V4. Um, I know a lot of guys like the ribbon mics um, and, and I do have a ribbon mic up at, the, up at the main studio, but this is a large diaphragm condenser. It works really great for pop music. Um, you know, it takes anything you got. And for me, um, like for Latin stuff, I, I tend to go that direction. Um, I was really fortunate that with, with the guys in Jungle Fire, our percussion player, Alberto Lopez, well, we have three percussion players, but he um, is, is a wonderful audio engineer. And so we, and I'm gonna turn around because I gotta plug my computer in because I'm running out of batteries. No worries, man. Um, Joel Seufer, who mixed my first solo record, he was in the studios with at the Earth, Wind and Fire studios in the 70s and yeah. was working on a lot of those records. So he was really great of like getting these misconceptions out of like what kind of microphones you have to use. Because um, it can be a really dark black hole <laughs> as far as like buying microphones and all that kind all right. of stuff. Um, so yeah, this... Vanguard V4, it's 400 bucks with shipping, um, which, you know, 400 bucks, 400 bucks, it's, it's a little bit of money, but yeah. you, you can use this and it's gonna sound great. I did, um, uh, what did I use this for the other week? So I think it's an Xbox game that's coming out and I did it here at the house for this composer I was working for, and he's super picky and, yeah. and he loved it. So I, I really recommend him. Um, they're built in Southern California. You can buy them online. Um, but then the Roy, uh, the ribbon mics I use, uh, I use, I can't even speak. I'm a really big fan of the Coles. Um, yeah, the 4038. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I Just for me personally, I like how I sound the best on those. Um, and I've used the Royers and some of the other ones. But for whatever reason, the way I play, when I hear myself on a Cole, um, I, I really, really like it. So... Um, yeah, but you know, I know, um, I was actually just talking to Wayne, um, the AEA microphones are fantastic. Yeah, They have one that you can get for about 800 bucks. It's a ribbon and I forget if it's R92 and we can look it up, but it sounds amazing. And I'm going to pick one of those up actually just to have here at the house. But, yeah. um, yeah, but you know what, to be totally honest, man, like they, they're so close. You hear a bunch of them. It's this kind of personal preference, you know. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it, you know, a lot of it too. There's, there's a science behind it. There's the room. There's this. You know, you're not going to sound as good as you are at Capitol Records than you are in your, your home studio. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but you know what? But it's funny you mentioned that though. Like, I've heard stuff done in the homes, and it sounds amazing. Like, yeah. you know, if you have the right, like my my living room actually has like vaulted ceilings and it's wood flooring. Yeah. So I recorded it there and just. A and beat it with some stuff I did at some of the bigger studios that I had files for. And was it as good? No, but it was pretty dang oh. close. Like yeah. close enough where it didn't really matter. So um, yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh, here's here, here's a great question. And I I, I, I always ask, um, I think I asked uh, Seraphine this, but I want to get your take on this. I think we even talk about this. Uh, this is from our buddy Joel. He's out in Las Vegas. He's a band, band leader. He oh, says, um, he says, uh, Sean, uh, love your stuff with the Brian Setzer Orchestra. As a band leader yourself, mm -hmm. how do you feel when young people carry these on the gig? <laughs> Selfies. Oh, on the gig? Um, yeah, that's a no-go. Yeah, it's, um, you know, so there's there's one, one time it, it now, am I going to say, like, I've never done that before? No, I've done that before. <laughs> I'm not going to lie and say that. But the, the, you know, the gigs that I contract 
and the guys that are kind of my crew that I hire, um, I don't really worry about the behavior thing um, for me personally when I'm hiring dudes. So I don't have to deal with that because they know that it's like the time or the place. However, if they are taking a picture, it's probably for a really good reason. So I kind of let it fly. But <laughs> um, in all seriousness, no, though, if I'm on a gig and I'm a side man and I see people doing that, I'll let them know like, bro, you should probably put that away because people will will flip out, you know. I would say the only time it's acceptable is, in, in all seriousness, you know, jokes aside, is if someone calls a chart or like a jazz standard and you don't know it, you could be like, all right, I'm gonna pull it up on my phone and read it. Um, Cause I've done that. Like I, you know, been on some, you know, those, those big event wedding gigs and somebody called a tune and you're like, oh man, I kind of know this, but I don't wanna like embarrass myself or ruin the event. So I'm gonna pull it up really quick. But, but yeah, doing the, the selfie stuff and, and also too, like, I mean, for me personally, like the whole videotaping yourself, practicing and posting on the Instagram and stuff, it's kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> like, Who cares? Yeah. Somebody has the guts to like post something like with them messing up, you know, <laughs> this is real, like, you know, it's like, yeah. But yeah, I think, you know, in, in all seriousness, being professional means you know, respecting the job that you're there to do, um, staying focused on it. And, and that's a big thing. I think like, you know, if you have your phone and you're, and you're doing stuff, you're not staying, staying focused on what's going on. Yeah. You know, I have a really good friend of mine who I is one of my first call guys that he does that stuff. He's not a, a trumpet player, you know, and I always have to bust him for it. I'm like, dude, <laughs> come on. like, you know, he, he plays so good though. It's like, there's no one else that can replace him. So but, uh, you know, it's, yeah, I think like keep it professional and, you know, there's a time and place for a picture. If you guys want to get a picture after the gig, cool, you know, go for it. So that's, well, that's, I know I, I'll, to add to that, I, I've talked to a lot of, you know, a lot of your, your, your peers mm -hmm. out in the LA area and, you know, some of that music, you know, the, the composers or the, the, you know, whoever you're recording for, whoever, they don't want that thing released. They don't want it out to the world. You know, that thing is secret. That thing is kind of a, you know, oh, and for you to take a picture of the score or the trumpet part or yeah. something like that, you know, that that could really get you blacklisted. A lot of young people do not understand that, you know, yeah. these composers, they, they don't want this thing out yet. Also, too, like, I, you know, I don't want everyone knowing what I'm doing, too. <laughs> you know, like, sometimes, like, and somebody made a good point, like, you know, you see these people are like posting about their vacations while they're on vacation. You're like, oh, I know where that guy lives. You know, I could go, uh, you know, exactly. and, you know, raid their, raid their refrigerator or whatever. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, one of my biggest, uh, he's a very dear friend, but a, a guitar player who's I one of my favorite musicians of all time, uh, a guy by the name of Patrick Bailey. He, he's actually... Fortunately, he's in, in my band, Jungle Fire. But I, I just kind of like defer to him on anything. And, and we were talking about social media stuff. And he's like, you, you kind of want like an element of mystery to yourself as an artist. You know, it's like when yeah. you know, like, I don't want to know what like my favorite musicians are doing for lunch. <laughs> like, it's just like, yeah. <laughs> I want, you know, I, I want this that guy to be like this mystery. You know, that's how you, you tell people like when you meet your heroes, a lot of time it's kind of disappointing. You're like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Also, uh, you know, just to touch on the social media thing, uh, just recently, last week, I and I, I, I want to get your take on this. Last week, I was sitting in with a combo, mm -hmm. and I played really safe because the person was filming, and yeah. I, I couldn't do my thing because I had to play real safe. Right. Because now, how do you feel about when someone's sitting there with their camera right in front of you? Yeah, I mean, it's annoying but I've just learned to deal with it. But I also try to like think of it this way, that most of that situation, it's somebody who's really, most of the time they're not a musician. And so they're really enjoying the moment and they want to remember it. And I also try to think that like, I probably would have been doing the same thing if I had a cell phone when I was in high school. I can guarantee that I would have been up in Arturo's face like, Yo, dude, playing in my phone, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I can't like sit here and be like, oh, yeah, I'm so much better because like I don't do that. But it's like that's what you know, like my kids will be like the Xbox for like three hours, and I'm like, dude, like go outside. <laughs> but I get it. I'd be doing the same yeah. thing. But yeah, I I don't like it, but I've gotten to the point where it doesn't bug me anymore. Yeah. And sometimes I'll just try to play off of it. Like I'll just put my bell right in their face or something like that. Um, but you know, thankfully I haven't seen many of those end up on YouTube and gone viral for the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that the, you know there's a, there's a, one of our peers that played the national anthem and it was yeah. televised and he cacked sure. the double A at the end and he. He, it was his mission in life to get that video taken down, you know? Uh, yeah. But anyway, um, so... I know, it's hard, man. That's, what I, that's what I always tell people. It's like, it's it's difficult now because we feel that we're in this environment where you can't make mistakes. Yeah. If, not even like music, man. Like just even, I mean, if this half the stuff that I have said in my life, if that was documented online, like, yeah, I wouldn't be working either. <laughs> you know? So... I mean, we have like a text thread going between like Serafine, Javier, myself, a couple other trouble players. I'm like, man, (laughs) don't let this get out. You know, if someone hacks our phone, we're all dead, man. But it's, yeah, we live in that kind of culture where there's like no mistakes. And if it's like, there is a mistake, then it's like, well, he's just a crappy trumpet player. And you're like, really? (laughs) Exactly. uh, They're coming in. So give me a second here. Um, I'm not doing anything. So here's a, oh, this is a great question, man. Uh, this is uh, Tabitha. She uh, She's a player out of South Carolina. Oh, cool. Wow, Tabitha, you're, you're staying up pretty late, six o'clock there. Yeah. Uh, she has Sean, do you, do you still get nervous? And if so, how do you deal with your nerves? Yes, and whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> whiskey. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we did the Academy Awards this year with Elton John. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was feeling the butterflies, like you walk out and you just get one take, you know? Um, I mean, not so much anymore. It's, it's, it gets better. Like it's you know, maybe a few times here and there, but I've kind of learned how to play, play through it, you know, just kind of make sure you're breathing right and just kind of go for it. Um, again, my whole thing is just um, knowing being secure in the way you play and and just knowing that like you're the one that's there doing it and anybody else would probably be in that position too. Um, this funny story, like we were doing I forget what it was, uh, but we were Warner brothers and it was Wayne and myself and I think Malcolm was playing too. And it's really funny. I was playing third trumpet. So I'm like, great coasting, you know, mm-hmm. the whole day is great. And we turned this cue over and and granted, I don't get to do a lot of that stuff with those guys, but I was on and big old third trumpet solo. And I was just like, oh, are you freaking kidding me? Like, ah, uh, and with a full orchestra and Wayne just leans over and he's like, better you than me. And I was just like, oh, God, this is not helping. But um, yeah, you know, you just kind of like, just calm everything down, go for it. And, and you know, the way I th- think about it, um, Dave Washburn had a really good quote. He's like, if you don't get nervous, um, it means you probably don't care. Yeah. You know? And so I was like, yeah, yeah it makes kind of like a good point. Um, good advice. Yeah. But you know, it's really funny though. I don't get nervous for big crowds. Uh, if I ever get nervous, it's more, it's like a small kind of thing, you know, um, the bigger the crowd, it's like, cool, let's go down. You know, we were doing something in Mexico with Gloria Trevi and, it, you know, I think it's like 50,000 people in that stadium. And, you know, I have this big solo where I have to play a big double A over, her vocal and it was like a live dvd shoot and i was expecting to be like a little jittery but it was nothing it's kind of like whatever so um and if it does happen i just deal with it like you know take some deep breaths and just try to play consistent um yeah and don't let it get to i mean just try not to let it affect you and I, and I do think it comes more from a uh, consistency of just doing it over and over again um but again, I think if anybody's saying like, um, you know, like, oh, I, I never get nervous. It's like, yeah, you probably do a little bit. So um, Malcolm had a funny story because, you know, I always love asking about his career and he'd just be like, I was like, what do you do if you get nervous? And he's like, well, first of all, I pretend that everyone in the room hates me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. Okay. All right. yeah, great. 
no um yeah so that's that's my take on it i mean i i think yeah sure from time to time i'll get nervous a little bit but um if it's something that i feel that i'm prepared for it's fine i think that's what i should have said that first if i'm if it's something i'm prepared for i've i've read it um you know practice it i'm good to go but then again like sight reading i like sight reading something on the fly in a really situation or had because you don't know what's coming up. And so you're just like, okay, I'm going. And then when you get done, you have time to think about it. And you're like, whoa, that was pretty intense. Yeah. But then and you're like, okay, let's do it again. And then you're like, oh, okay, now I'm actually nervous. You know, the, the first time. <laughs> so yeah, yeah there's, there's some good techniques um, about if, if you're really like dealing with that kind of stuff, um, there's some really good stuff online. I know Don Green, um, PhD, his books are really, really good about that. Um, I know a friend of mine, Annie Bosler, did a new project with him and he's great. Like he taught at Juilliard and, but also taught like the US diving team and like some police snipers about like performing under stress. Wow. So he's got some really, really good stuff in there that's it's worth a read. It's called Performing, I actually have it. Yeah, this one, Performance Success. Oh, cool. Yeah, this, yeah, by Don Green. Uh, G R E E N E, yeah. This is the, that Don Green, the trumpet player. No, there's two of them. But yeah, that's what everyone says. We're like that Don Green, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So that that's great. It's really got some good stuff in there. It's more based towards like orchestral auditions, yeah. but there's some really good stuff in there that you can kind of take. Okay. So, cool. Yeah. Uh, did, okay, I'll ask the next. One. This is Mike. This is I'll, I'll I'm gonna ask my question. Nice. <laughs> so here's my question. You know, Sean, you're obviously, you know, the, the pandemic slowed you down, but it didn't stop you. Sure. Uh, for a lot of our peers, it stopped them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the thing is, is that, um, you know, what did you do? And I think, Sean, I think it's, I think it's your attitude, the way you, your your just your, your basic uh, mentality on things, you know, but well, what did you do to say, okay, well, uh, this is what I have to work with. And uh, yeah, I'm not playing live anymore, but I can still record. I can still do this. Mm -hmm. still do that. What, you know, a lot of people complain. This is my question. A lot of people complain, Sean, about not being inspired or not being, you know, not having the motivation to practice and this that, and the other. What did you do to say, you know what? this is my motivation. This is my inspiration. This is what I'm going to go for. Even, even now, you know, with all the things going on. Yeah. So again, not to like kind of like minimize the situation um, yeah. because yeah, like we're, I'm fortunate to be in a situation where, you know, yeah, I lost a lot of work, like considerable amounts, but I have enough stuff going on to kind of get through hopefully till you know, kind of what we've been talking about is like, seems like people on the inside were thinking like April of next year, where, you know, you might see some semblance of, you know, normalcy kind of thing. Yeah. Obviously, no expert. Um, but, you know, going off my calendar, that's when everything starts being booked again. All right. I w <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, man, when we had the lockdown, I was kind of into it because I didn't have to run around all day and go from gig to gig and hustle. I actually have spent more time practicing these last seven months than I probably have like in 20 years, just doing stuff that I didn't get a chance to practice. And so I was super motivated to work on stuff that was bugging me that I just never had time to. Cause I mean, my days literally like, you know, six to eight, seven days a week would be 8 a.m. to like midnight, you know? And so there's only so much time to like sit down and be like, cool, man, like I want to work on this etude that I never learned for whatever reason, you know? So um, I've been using this time to practice just, you know, I have a list of things that I want to go over, so, you know, some tunes that I want to learn, um, working on just my arranging and writing, doing a lot of original stuff. I think I have like, you know, like 10 original tunes in the in the tank, whether I ever release them, you know, I'll probably hate them next month and be like, oh, this sucks and I'll throw it away. <laughs> but 
yeah, and then with with Jungle Fire, we had some outstanding projects that we were working on, a um, couple of collaborations and stuff that we were, you know, obviously doing at the studio. And we were being very precautious, like with the guys, you know, doing testing before we would come to the studio and stuff like that. Um, and, and thankfully, no one in our crew has gotten sick or anything like that. But yeah, but I I use it as more of a motivational thing because if I'm th- sitting there thinking like now I have like I mean I, you know every day I probably have like eight hours five hours to practice I'm never going to get that time back um it's like being in college again you know and and also too like I mean I'm teaching about I have about 15 private students but since we're doing it online you know it's the time frame is a lot more condensed so I can work on other stuff so for me I used it as like I want to make myself better on a number of things, you know, um, do a lot of reading and, you know, just things like that. So that's kind of what um, I'm focused on. Just trying to stay in the moment, you know, kind of like take it day by day and say, this is what I'm doing today, this is going. And again, like I look at my calendar for next year, everything looks great, you know, a lot of stuff overseas and, you know, stuff here too, but it's like, it's all hypothetical. If that falls apart, yeah, I know it's not my fault. You know, and we were talking like, yeah, there's some amazing players that have been forced to like, you know, get jobs not in the music industry. Um, and, you know, that's no one's fault. Well, I, I'll blame somebody, but I'm not, it's not your fault. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I think like, if if we have to suck it up for a couple of years, um, you know, especially if you're younger, you know, hopefully you're not dealing with this, but yeah. guys that are like our age that have been in our careers, if we have to, you know, pivot for a couple of years, at least like mentally, you know, that it's not like you've messed up on a gig or, you know, you made the wrong career choices. It's like, this is totally out of our, out of our control. Um, but again, like it, it seems, you know, I'm thinking positive and, uh, you know, talking to, uh, you know, the, the thing that's tough, it's like, it's happening to everywhere in the world. I have a lot of friends of mine that are musicians in Spain and there's like, my uh, buddy of mine, he's like, bro, I haven't had a gig since March of last year. And he's like one of the best guys out there. So thankfully here, we, we've been, you know, doing some driving gigs and, and, you know, there's, you know, projects that need to be done and stuff like that. But yeah, again, it's, it's just trying to manage and, and stay in the moment. But yeah, I just, as far as the practicing, I just really try to take that time to do it. Um, you know, and just try to, make a list of like, this is stuff I need to work on and, and, and try to get a little bit better at it, you know? So yeah. but then there's days I just want to lay down on the couch, you know, <laughs> yeah. just watch Netflix or something, you know? Yeah. yeah. Right. I get it, man. I, I, I'm in your camp on that one. And you know, there's, this is uh, and again, Sean, I want to thank you for your time. I'm going to take one more question, but I want to thank you for your time, my friend. You know, Anytime, man. Yeah, you're it's a great fun. cat. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it was great you know, having this time with you. And uh, I want to thank yeah, all of you. Anybody needs my email or phone, they want to throw some ideas around, you know, you can totally give it out. I'm more than happy to talk about stuff and all that. So, yeah. And, and I've noticed that a lot of the guys like yourself and, uh, you know, guys like Seraphine that are at that level, you know, mm-hmm. are the most approachable guys, nicest guys, you know. So uh, mm-hmm. for those of you. Yeah, I, I took it. Like, you have to be, especially – you know, I mean, there's amazing players all around the world. Like everybody's replaceable. And if you, and if you think you're not, then it's like, I don't know, man, <laughs> maybe not. But <laughs> like you know, every day you're seeing somebody come up, you're just like, man, he or she can play, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's, 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 you have to be at that level. And yeah. you know, it just makes you more of an enlightened person. I think if you can you know, just be friendly and get along with people. Yeah, you guys are great human beings. That's what I was going to say. Is, you know, um, but here's don't, the last question. Don't get together in public, though, then it gets crazy. You know? <laughs> so here's the last question. This is from Marcus. Marcus is in New York City. Oh, and he's nice. asking this question. He says, Sean, I am a junior at Columbia University majoring in music. And uh, nice. I... I'm second thinking of my, my career choice because sure. of COVID and the effects afterwards. Right. What is your recommendation to someone who's having second thoughts about their career move to being a professional musician? Right. 
So, yeah, we've been talking a lot about this. Um, and first of all, tell them congrats on being in Columbia. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I think that, and again, I, I do think positive on this. And <laughs> this country specifically has shown time and time again that people want to go out and party and have a good time. And I think that when there's a concern about live music not coming back to what it was, I think that it's going to be the opposite at some point. It's people need to go out and get that release. And so I think that, yeah, maybe we, we're going to kind of see kind of the downslope for a little bit of time, but I, I do think it's going to come back. Um, and, and that's not just my opinion. That's also talking to friends of mine that are agents that, you know, do stuff that's not on the performance side. Um, and all of them are real pretty gung ho against, like I said, about like March or April uh, kind of going forward. So I would say like the only time that you should consider like not keeping the music career going is this you personally don't want to do it anymore. Um, if you have your heart set on doing it, um, you should go for it 100% of the time. Um, and, you know, in your situation, you said you're a junior. I mean, I got to imagine by the time you graduate, things are going to be kind of rocking and rolling. Now, with that being said, it also is contingent like on the type of music you're doing. Um, I think that you know, there is some legitimate concerns about some of the big orchestra stuff or, you know, big touring Broadway shows. Um, just because, I mean, you look at like what's popular, what's what kind of popular music is out there um, and, you know, what's our fan base for, you know, our brass quintet or our big band or something like that. And the, the thing that concerned me is more what I saw before COVID was like lo losing audiences um, you know, certain genres. And so I think that needs to be addressed is like, how do you make it so younger people can come to these shows or we can have a better time? You know, my, I mean, I love going to see orchestras play. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I sub with the Pacific Symphony and, you know, I got to play with Ellie Phil with a Snarky Puppy once and I, I just wanted to yell like, yeah, this is great. You know, and, you know, you yeah. felt it, it was a little restrictive. And so I think we need to figure out how to make that environment fun. Um, that's why I you always tell with like Latin bands, like there's always going to be work for that. People want to go out and dance, party, have a good time. Like you will, that will always be there. So when someone, I, when they're talking about reconsidering the music career, I would say just be very careful that you're doing it for the right reasons and not just because of what's going on right now. Um, especially when you're young. I mean, you, you have a lot of long time to develop. Um, but depending on what you're majoring or what kind of music you're passionate about, you do need to be realistic of what opportunities are out there. So, um, you know, some of the stuff that I love to play, I can guarantee you no one would come, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have tickets, you know, but then again, some of the, the stuff that I love to play too, we sell out Staples Center, you know, when we're, we're playing with Gloria and, and Alejandra. So, you know, it's just being very cognizant of that. Um, you know, but then again, it's like, know that like just even even before COVID, people that were full-time musicians were doing other things in the entertainment industry. Um, you know, I mean, I was putting bands together for weddings or recording sessions. And so it's, yeah, I'm not playing in that particular time, but I'm I'm doing something creative and fun. So I would say don't stop but just know that there's other things that you can do creatively but i'm definitely not a fan of the whole uh make sure you have something to fall back on i, I say go for it and if you fail then you just go do something else like there's no because i think if you have that in the back of your mind that like oh, i can just go be a banker then you're not going to push yourself you right. know so keep that in mind but yeah but i i'm I, i'm feeling positive about it again just like I'm no expert, but just from the people I've been talking to and seeing kind of what's going on. But again, maybe we'll do this again in a couple of months and I'll be like, yeah, so I got a gig doing a, you know, <laughs> selling cars because. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
exactly. Yeah. But I think it's your whole outlook on this thing, and I think that's important. It's your outlook. Sure. And, uh, another thing as well is a lot of students don't understand that the information they're getting from their their I would say their instructors, mm -hmm. the opportunities that were around when their instructors were working aren't the same as now. Right. You know, uh, right. you know, all your peers talk about the studio scene going like this, diminishing, you know, and yeah, it's, it's not what it was like in the eighties or the nineties or even the seventies. So, you yeah. know, those careers aren't going to be as, you know, as available for the next generation coming up. Yeah, and the one thing I say about that, um, this is one thing that, that Wayne had told me, and and I try to tell people, is like you can have an amazing career, and not set foot in a single, like big recording studio. Like the having that thought process of like that's the top, I I don't think is necessary. Um, and and so in regards to the studio stuff, yes, like the big you know, orchestral recording sessions are seen to be, you know, spreading out all over the world and kind of going down. But me personally, like I'm doing two or three sessions a week for random things, whether it's a small horn section or overdubbing some trumpet solo stuff. So there's more recorded music going on now than there ever has been. It's just you have to find where it's at and what kind of people to be involved with. So um, I always tell young people, like, get involved with, like, non, whatever instrument you play, like, get involved with other musicians that don't play that. So, like, right. go play with rock bands, go play with a punk rock band, go. And so not only are you unique, but you're also the only person that plays that instrument. So there's a couple clients that I work for that, you know, for whatever reason, I mean, I work with them. And if I'm not available, like, they just don't even use a trumpet. Which is funny because I'm like I can get a guy and they're like, nah, that's fine. Or just you know, <laughs> so um, you know, my buddy Ron Jubla, who he was a Ricky Martin sax player and wonderful sax player in L.A. and, and he works at uh, Musicians Institute, MI. Um, where I'm going to be teaching at too in the fall. Um, the uh, Ron who I say like go get the gigs that no one else wants because then you know you're not competing with hundred people and you can become your own artist and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, I think that's really significant to think about like doing the gigs and doing something that is a little off of center, you know, like yeah. don't feel like you need to be playing in this big band or that orchestra to make it like there's so much other stuff out there that is that you can make a great career. It just might not be where kind of you expect it. You know, right. So yeah, so I know there like there can be that mentality of like, you know, oh, well, I, you know, we're not all going to be John Lewis or yeah. Chris Martin or you know, it's like, but there's so much other stuff, you know, and and yeah. I, you can you can do that, and and be really happy doing it. You know, it's just it's just kind of figuring that out. But that's what I kind of go back to working with original stuff because there's always original music going on. And the more you can branch out, um, you know, you have other things going on and, and whatnot. So that's, you know, that's my take on it. So <laughs> that's great advice. So that's, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, you know, need to hear this, you know, cause they, they don't know. I mean, they only know what they've been taught. Yeah. You know, when they hear from someone like you saying, Hey, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's more fruit in the orchard. You just got to go look for it. You know? Yeah, it's so, it's so it, that's why you, with, with my private students, we do a lot of playing by ear. Um, so much of the recording stuff I do now, there's no charts, you know. Yeah. We did something like two nights ago for this band called RBD, RBD, RBG, that, that pop band from Mexico. Yeah. And, uh, you know, no charts, but like pretty detailed parts. And they're like, okay, here you go. And it's like, uh, all right, so you got to figure it out, you know, yeah. by ear and, and you're paying for time. So there's, a lot of situations like that. So is, is you know, is, is as important as to be a really, really great sight reader, you would need to really, really be able to play by ear quite a bit. Um, yeah. So, which is something that we don't traditionally get to do a lot. Yeah. So that's why I always tell people, you know, go to jam sessions, go jam with people, just make stuff up, 
you know, so you can get, get that experience. Right. Yeah. Well, Sean, I, first of all, man, thank you so much for your time, brother. You, anytime, man, we can do it again, whenever, if, you know, people like, again, uh, if anybody wants to talk more in depth about anything, I'm around. So, and you know, guys, uh, just side note, Sean's like one of the nicest cats out there. If you ever, I'm pretty sure if you want to take a lesson from him, he'd be more than happy to help you with that. You just contact him via yeah. Facebook or Instagram. Sure. And, um, you know, if not, I can give you his contact info and put you in touch with him. Yeah, but, for sure. uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. That was, this is a, this was a great webinar, Sean. Again, thank you for your time, brother. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, it was great having you, man. And uh, everybody have a safe and happy holiday coming up. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, we'll see you next week. And Sean, man, we look forward to seeing all the stuff you come up with, brother. Sounds good, brother. I appreciate Bye. it. Later, man. All right, see you guys. Bye.